start. Uh, recording pending. There we go. We are started officially. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for attending our webinar today on using Gold Rush for collection analysis. My name is Cynthia Holt and I'm the executive director for Call CBUA. Uh, this webinar, uh, who, which will be uh, presented by Alexandra Marcaccio, who is a collections analysis intern at Memorial University Libraries. Um, this is actually uh, uh, sponsored by the Call, collection, uh, Call CBUA Collections Committee, the, the webinar. Um, and Alexandra has kindly uh, uh, volunteered to uh, share her experience and her um, what she's learned and uh, in using Gold Rush at Memorial in their collections analysis process uh, and to share those with the rest of us. Uh, first, a few housekeeping things. Um, I do ask that you uh, turn off your video uh, uh, during the session just to save bandwidth for those of folks in low bandwidth areas. As well, uh, if you can mute your audio, uh, for those who are coming in via phone and don't have mute buttons, you could do star six to mute and star six to unmute. Uh, otherwise, if you can uh, just mute your uh, your microphones, that will help us as well in terms of uh, the recording and the clarity of uh, Alexander's presentation. Uh, before we start, Call CBUA represents member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunutsiwut and Nunutkinwut. Uh, the Innu of Natasinan, uh, the Beotic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated in the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, uh, libraries are found on the land of the Wustuk, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples uh, who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Alexandra and she will be sharing her slide deck, which uh, just as an FYI, this session is being recorded, so it will also be uploaded to the Call website after the webinar. And I will uh, send a message out to everybody who attended the meeting today to let them know when that is up there as well as uh, sharing uh, Alexandra's slide deck. Uh, so thank you very much, Alexandra, and you can take it away. Thank you very much, um, Cynthia. So hi, everyone. Um, my video will eventually go away once I start sharing my slides, but I thought I'd just give myself a little intro. I'm Alexandra. I, as Cynthia mentioned, I'm the collection analysis intern at Memorial. And today we're going to be talking a bit about Gold Rush and some of the very interesting analysis projects I've gotten to do with it so far. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen and we will get started. Okay. Alrighty, so. Just to give you guys a brief agenda of what's going on today, um, we have a lot to cover in a short amount of time and we're gonna do our best to cover as much as possible. Um, I'm going to start by just giving an overview of Gold Rush and its features. Um, because Gold Rush sometimes can be a little slow and right now I think they're going through indexing. I'm not gonna be doing any live demos, but we will be kind of going through Gold Rush. I'll be sharing a whole bunch of screenshots from the tool just so you can see how it works, how it functions and what some of its features look like. From there, I'm going to look at two different example projects, both of which I have been working on for the last few months um, that cover kind of different strategies and ways that you can implement Gold Rush into different types of analysis projects. Um, for both of them, I will be giving context as to what the project is and how it functioned within the project. The first one's gonna be a little bit of a simpler, like basic overlap analysis project. And the other one is going to be kind of looking at a larger project that we had in mind and looking at how we were able to kind of break that project down into different tasks for Gold Rush. Um, then there will be a brief conclusion and reflection where I really want us to think about not only how does Gold Rush function in these projects, but how has it allowed us to ask even further and more interesting questions um, to kind of continue to push our work further. And then there will be some time for questions. Um, if any questions arise during the presentation, feel free to pop them in the chat. Just because of the way I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat as I'm going, um, but I'll make sure to answer any of your questions at the end. So just to give a very brief overview of Gold Rush, 
This is an analysis tool that was developed by the Colorado Alliances of Research Libraries. Um, it's got a few different features. So there are some that are more focused on comparing journals. Um, other, there are a couple other features, but the key one that I'm gonna be focusing on today is called Gold Rush Decision Support. So this is an overlap analysis tool um, where you can compare your library's holdings. Either you can just an analyze your library's holdings in and of themselves, or you can compare your library's holdings to items indexed from other libraries. Um, so what happens is, is everyone who contributes, every library that contributes their items to Gold Rush, those get indexed every month. And then it allows you to go in and compare your library's holdings that have been indexed to those other universities. So as an example, um, at that screenshot below, um, that tell, shows you some of the different collections and different consortias and partnerships that have uploaded their holdings to Keep It Downs or to Gold Rush. Um, a lot of them are based out of the states, such as the Colorado Wyoming one. Um, but one of the key ones is Keep It Downs You. And that is the one that's most relevant to me because that is a partnership of Canadian university libraries that have all indexed their holdings in Gold Rush. So when you first open Gold Rush, this is the screen you get. So again, you get that comparing journal databases um, tool, which allows you to compare different journals and different vendors and what they offer. Um, there's the Gold Rush tutorials area, which can help you kind of navigate Gold Rush. And again, the one that I've circled there that is most important to me at least, which is comparing library catalogs. So when you open that one up, you get something that looks like this. Um, with this screenshot here, I've set it to the Keep It Downs View collections, which allows me to compare Memorial's holdings to McMaster, University of Toronto, University of Ottawa, Western University, and Queen's University. So with this tool, it allows you to have a search bar right here where you can just search some keywords, it allows you to pick which libraries you're going to compare. Um, and then once we get into a kind of deeper analysis and actually start doing a search, there are more filters that will pop up and other things we can do. So to start, you can either pick to just look at one university. So here in this screenshot, I've only picked Memorial University and you can just do a search on that one university library catalog, or you can actually select a few others to compare to. Um, so you have options as to kind of how you're using this tool, whether you wanna just look and drill down deep into your own catalog or whether you wanna be comparing it to any other catalog. So there's a bit of flexibility there. Um, from there, once you open up a search, you're going to get a whole bunch of different filters. So some of them are pretty common that we see, such as format. So for example, do I want to look at books? Do I want to look at electronic materials, journals and serials, etc.? But what's pretty interesting about Gold Rush is the branch and location code filters. So um, in that middle screenshot for branch code, it's pretty interesting because I can look at a specific library location and just look at the holdings there. So for Memorial, we have the QE2, we have the Center for Newfoundland Studies, we have the Health Sciences Library. So I can just look at that library, those libraries specifically. Um, that very first filter at the top here that says uh, Memorial UCA All is just a way of representing a location or a branch where the electronic um, things are stored because obviously they are not associated with a specific branch. I can actually drill down even further and look at location codes. So these are specific locations within the branches. Again, we have one called unspecified. That is again for electronic items. We have the stacks, we have local storage, periodicals. So much more specific locations than just the actual building that things are stored in. And this is where things can get really interesting. And we can really narrow things down to very specific collections or very specific subsets of a collection that we want to compare to other university libraries or just even analyze in and of themselves. So once you pick something to compare, so let's just say, for example, I was comparing Memorial to McMaster, which is what this first example on the left is, um, Gold Rush will then generate these kind of interesting looking graphs. So in this first graph here, we have Memorial and their holdings represented on the left and McMaster and their holdings represented on the right. The graph is then broken down into kind of two chunks um, that are color coded. So the dark blue on each of those uh, bar graphs represents the items that are in common between Memorial and McMaster. So in this example, I just ran Memorial versus McMaster. I did not filter it in any sort of way. So this is the entirety of the holdings that are cataloged and indexed in Gold Rush. And then the light blue represents items that are unique to each library. So 
the graph is kind of meant as a visualization. And then at the bottom here, we get kind of the more specific numbers. So if we look at set one, which is all the numbers associated with Memorial, we know that in total, there is about three and a half million items that are indexed in Gold Rush. Of those three and a half million items, about 2,750,000 are unique to Memorial, meaning that McMaster does not have a copy of them. And about 780,000, so almost 800,000, are items that are in held in common between both McMaster and Memorial. And then you get like a similar set of numbers for McMaster. So almost 2 million items have been indexed at this point when I took this screenshot. And of that, about 1 million are unique to McMaster. You also don't have to compare just one library to one library. You can actually compare a library to multiple libraries, which is what that screenshot on the right represents. So in this one, I've compared all of Memorial's holdings to McMaster and Ottawa and U of T and Queens and Western. So when this happens, we get a few more um, additional columns. So we have our usual total, our unique, our common. But what's interesting is that you can also get how many items are held at two or more libraries, three or more libraries, or four or more libraries. Right now, it says narrow your search because I am searching almost 20 million items. And Gold Rush will not be able to tell me those specific numbers when the search is so large. But if you were to narrow your search to say about 50,000 items, you can get those numbers for what's held at two, three, or four libraries. So it's really interesting and allows you to get a really brief snapshot of your collection and what the overlap might look like without having to really dig very deep and just kind of get that overview. Um, another interesting thing is the pivot reports. So these are essentially like pivot tables, almost like what you would build in Excel, but that are generated within Gold Rush itself. So say I do a search like I've done here, which I believe this was a search for the music library collection. Um, I can then open the pivot reports and it allows me to pick two items to or two facets to compare to and just see what the numbers look like. So in this top example here, I have chosen to compare the subject headings that are found and listed for each of the items in this results or the results of this search to the format. So I can figure out, for example, how many books that have the subject heading law exist? How many journals that have that subject heading exist? And so this can give me a brief overview of some of those numbers. And again, maybe speak a bit more to the character of the collection than a basic overview analysis or overlap analysis like those graphs previously could show me. So it allows me to get a, that better sense of the character. So those are just some of the features. Um, and I know that's quite a quick overview, but now, I'd like to actually get in and talk about how these different features actually apply to specific overlap projects that I have done in the past. So we're going to start with a bit of a more basic overlap analysis one for this first example. So um, to just introduce what happened, um, Memorial University has been part or piloting a partnership with the Keep It Downs View initiative. For those who don't know, Keep It Downs View is a shared print initiative that's housed here in Ontario where I am. And it is an initiative that a uh, partnership between McMaster University, University of Toronto, Queen's University, Western University, and University of Ottawa. So our pilot period partnership concluded back in February of this year, and we were writing up a report on the findings from that partnership. Part of what we needed was to figure out what kind of overlap existed between Memorial's collection and the different partner universities collections because we wanted to try to figure out what kind of unique content Memorial could potentially be contributing to the shared print initiative at Downsview. We wanted to try to determine how many items we might be contributing, how unique our collection was compared to these other collections and that sort of thing. And also look at zero in and look at some very specific collections instead of just looking at our holdings in their entirety. We also want to compare not just to Downsview, which is where the sh storage exists, but we also wanted to try to kind of figure out our percentage of overlap between our collection and the other Keep It Downsview collections. So not just Toronto specifically, but these other libraries. So we had a couple different very specific collections that we started to compare to, and here are two examples. First, we were doing a bit of a monograph overlap with our items in DocuGuard. So DocuGuard is the offsite storage at Memorial, where we currently have quite a few 
pre-1989, I believe, uh, monographs that we think we should probably be contributing to Down's view. So in order to figure out what has to go to um, Down's view and what um, needs to be taken care of otherwise, we need to figure out approximately what was the overlap between those monographs stored in DocuGuard and the monographs already in Down's view. So if any item already existed in Down's view, it wouldn't make sense for us to send that item along again because we don't want duplicates. Um, another interesting question to consider is what is the overlap between the monographs in DocuGuard and all of the University of Toronto library branches? So because Down's view, which is the storage site is located within Toronto, if there was an item that did not exist in Down's view that we owned, but a different University of Toronto library branch owned, it would make a lot more sense for them to be the ones to contribute it because the item is in such closer proximity and it would mean a lot less costly in terms of shipping. Another question we had was to kind of broaden out a bit further and think about the monograph overlap of all of our libraries. So we were wondering what is the overlap between all of our monographs, excluding any items we have at the Center for Newfoundland Studies, just because of that being a provincially unique collection, and each of the Keep It Downs View partners. So instead of looking at very specific locations, again, broadening our scope. And then we also wanted to think about, instead of just comparing um, our collection to individual um, library collections, what does that overlap look like between our monographs, again, excluding the Center for Newfoundland Studies, and all of the partners combined? So yes, we're gonna have a certain percentage overlap when we look at each university library individually, but what happens when we broaden that scope even further to look at the larger picture? What can we learn from that? So um, for this, to give you a bit of a sense of my method, I focused my search on print materials. So I really heavily used those format filters. I made sure to remove any electronic items, any government documents and only focus on books. And I was keeping my branch and location filters very specifically to refine my search down to the very specific subset of our collection that I wanted. Um, from there, I could then use those, remember those graphs I showed you in an earlier slide? We can use those resulting graphs and charts that show the overlap to really quickly compare that overlap and get a sense of the numbers. So this is an example of what those graphs look like. So in this example, I have run a search where I looked at Memorial University's collections that are print books, that are not electronic, that are not government documents, that exist in DocuGuard, so using that local storage filter. And I've looked at that compared to the University of Toronto libraries. So no specific location filter, just their entirety. And I got a graph that looked like this. The reason why there's no like unique part to the graph over the University of Toronto libraries is because I did all of my filtering and refining before I added in my comparator. I found that this worked very a lot smoother and worked a lot better to like filter down to the specific collection you wanted before running a comparison. Um, so that's why, because that search didn't involve any items from University of Toronto libraries, and I was focusing solely on a collection that existed from Munn, that's why we don't get any unique items here. But from here, I really quickly can get a sense of, okay, this is how many items exist at Memorial. This is how many of those items from this search are unique and how many are common, so exist at both library systems. So this kind of takes you, this little chart here takes you through the series of different overlaps I ran to do with DocuGuard. So we know that the total items in DocuGuard that fit our search criteria was about 186,000 items. And then what we did is we looked at just Downs View specifically, so what exists in Downs View versus what exists in DocuGuard, and found that about 81.7% of that collection in DocuGuard is unique to DocuGuard, meaning that only about 18.3% already exist in Downs View. This tells us that there's a lot of unique items here that we could be potentially giving over to Downs View as part of the shared print initiative. However, and this is where a lot of interesting questions got raised, when I brought in my scope out, instead of just looking at the Downsview location and looked at the entirety of the University of Toronto Library system, the numbers changed quite a bit. So we went from having almost 82% of items being unique to DocuGuard to only about 60% of the items being unique to DocuGuard, which tells us that while there isn't a huge overlap between Downsview, there is still a pretty significant overlap between our collection and the University of Toronto Library system collection. So 
obviously just getting these numbers really quickly, very quickly raised a few questions for us. So first of all, we had a much higher percentage of unique content that's held in DocuGuard than we originally thought. We estimated the number, the amount of overlap to be a lot higher and the amount of unique items to be a lot lower. So what does this imply to what for us? Well, that a lot of items are going to have to be shipped to Downsview more than we were originally estimating. Another thing that was interesting was to see very quickly how different of an overlap we had when we looked at Downsview versus the whole of the University of Toronto Library system. And what we now have to wonder is, how does that stark difference in overlap affect any transfers to Downsview? Should we maybe be coordinating with University of Toronto Libraries as a larger system instead of always focusing solely on what's stored in Downsview? These are a lot of questions to consider. And given how quickly I was able to get these numbers, it's something that we can really like think about and have a lot of time to think about because the overlap doesn't take long to do. So then we expand out our scope to look at all of the monographs that exist at MUN and comparing them to the different library systems. So here in the first column, I have all the different libraries that we were looking at. There's a star beside Western only because due to an indexing issue, I had to run those numbers about a month and a half, almost two months later than the other ones. So I don't know if maybe that could affect things. So I just have it starts for my own purposes. Um, but what we learned is that aside from Toronto, the amount of overlap between our collection and each university library collection individually is pretty consistent. So we have a pretty consistent anywhere from about 60 to 75% um, amount of items that are unique to our library collections compared to the other libraries. Um, but then if we look at that all column, which is where I compared memorials holdings to McMaster's, Queens, Ottawa, Toronto, and Western, all at the same time, that amount of um, unique content significantly decreases all the way down to 30%. So it's about half of what um, it looks like if you compare just the um, numbers at MUN to each of the university libraries individually. Again, this is going to raise a lot of questions. This type of an overlap analysis only takes about an hour or so to do. And right away, we get a snapshot that can raise a lot of interesting questions for us. So one thing that's interesting to note, again, is that we do have a pretty similar rate of overlap between ourselves and the different partner universities. And that does make us wonder, what does this mean about any future contributions that we make to Downsview? Should we be focusing, like we did in that DocuBoardGuard example, on solely U of T, or should we be thinking a little bit broader? Another interesting th thing to think about is how low the amount of unique content is and how high the overlap is when you start comparing all of those libraries together instead of just one at a time. So that makes us wonder, there's a lot of um, overlap, not just between us and individual libraries, but between each of the libraries and each other. And so we're wondering now, how might we coordinate shipment of items to Downsview, especially when you have two, maybe even three or four university libraries that have that same item? Obviously, we're not going to have multiple libraries contribute that same item. So what's an efficient way to try to coordinate any of those shipments and contributions? So even though this is a pretty basic overlap analysis, there are a lot of really interesting and rich questions that can come from it. So now we're going to move on to a second project that I worked on. This one slightly more complicated. So this one is one where we had like a much broader question and we had to figure out how can we break that question down into actual specific tasks that can be done in Gold Rush. So for a bit of context, uh, Memorial at Memorial, there has been a proposed law school that will have approximately 80 students per year. So because of this, we're going to have to expand our holdings and our collections to be able to include materials that are necessary to support a JD program. Right now, our library collection does need to be kind of bulked out a bit in order to do this. Another interesting thing is that the library is going to be working with a very limited budget to build and maintain such a collection. We don't have infinite money, and so we really need to be careful and strategic with how we're identifying items that could be good for that collection. So this leads to me having a whole bunch of different questions about how I might go about this. So to start, I thought about, OK, well, how do our holdings compare to other law schools? It could be really useful to look at larger law schools like Queens or University of Toronto 
to see what kind of items they're carrying, what kind of items multiple law schools might be carrying, and that might help us to identify some of the more core tax and that sort of thing. Another interesting thing to think about is print versus electronic. So what print materials are commonly found and used at different law schools and in different law libraries? Um, on the flip side, what are the electronic materials that might be necessary for our collection? And when we look at all these different collections, there's going to be a huge variety of items. So what are the materials that are going to be strong candidates for purchasing? So these are just some of the questions that came to mind when I thought about this project. And then most importantly, at the bottom here, the main question, which is, how do we take these different questions I have about this task and turn it into actionable tasks that can be done in Gold Rush? So um, first of all, I immediately thought of Gold Rush because of the fact that we have access to the Keep It Downsview partner collections. So four of the five Keep It Downsview partners, so Western Toronto, um, Ottawa and Queens, all have law programs and law libraries. So that's a really easy like lo access or location that I can go to to try to access different law collections and try to figure out what we might be purchasing. We can compare our own holdings using Gold Rush to these different collections. And we can even compare these collections to each other to try to maybe identify some core text. Um, so I started first with the print analysis, um, just because if we focus and use that branch filter, all these universities have law libraries and it's a really good source to go to to figure out what kind of materials are often kept in a law library because those are gonna be the key materials that we will need for our own collection. So when I think about that, I was thinking about what subjects are commonly covered within law or outside of law, if there are um, subject areas that are covered that are maybe adjacent to law or intersect with law, but don't necessarily carry that subject or the LC class K title. Another thing to think about is what types of non-book materials are found in law libraries. Are there government documents? Are there journals? Are, are print journals common? I wasn't sure, so I needed to think about things like that. And finally, what is the overlap between our holdings and these law libraries? So are there items that we own already that could be used and can contribute to a solid law collection? Is there like a foundational amount of items that we can use as like the basis for our own law collection as we start to build one? So we need to do a bit of a use analysis of print to inform analysis of the electronic materials because the electronic materials were gonna get a lot more complicated. But if I under use the print analysis to understand the nature and the character of law collections, I can like, apply those different lessons into doing an electronic material analysis. So I started by just doing a very basic comparison between each of the universities that had law schools and their law libraries to Memorial University. So in this screenshot here, we have the Queen's Law Library. Um, that's what's represented in that final bit of the branch code here in the search string. And I compared it to Memorial University. And of all of the items in Queen's Law Library, about 10,512 overlap with Memorial. And we will see similar patterns arise as I look at each of the different university libraries, um, law libraries and Memorial. Another thing I did was then use those pivot reports, if you remember me showing in an earlier in a much earlier slide at the beginning, to try to figure out the nature and the character of these law library collections. So in this example, we're returning to Queen's University, and this is their Lederman Law Library collection. And I just threw it in a pivot table really quickly to get some sense of what the collection looks like. So in this example, I have the LC class listed in on the left in the columns, and then running across the top, I had different uh, material types. Because one of the things I was curious about is, aside from books, what are some of those other really common material types? And then if you remember, one of my other questions was, what kind of non-K law subjects are commonly found? What are some of those more interdisciplinary topics we need to think about? So from this right away, you can see that there is a fair number of government documents and journals and serials that exist in a law library. And you can see some of those other topics that really get highlighted such as social science, political science, education. Social science and political science weren't too surprising, but when we drill down further, we're gonna see some interesting things. So 
Um, for the law libraries, just to give you an overview, I went through and did the same thing for Ottawa, Toronto, and um, U of T, or sorry, Ottawa, Toronto, and Western. Um, and for those collections as a whole, there's approximately 60 to 76,000 items that are exist in each of those law library collections. So that gives me a sense right away of how big of a collection we might need to strive for at some point. The other interesting thing is that no matter which collection, which of those law libraries I compared MUN to, there was always about a 16% overlap between all of Memorial's holdings and each law library individually. So this tells me that we have a long way to go in terms of building some sort of law collection and that we're gonna have to purchase quite a bit of material to bring our collection up to this standard. And then another interesting thing, which you can, which you got to start to see from that pivot table with Queens, um, but aside from print books, there's it's pretty common to find some print serials, which was surprising to me, but um, I guess now having done more analysis, it looks like um, print serials are still fairly common in a law discipline compared to electronic journals. And then the other thing was government documents, which again, wasn't super surprising to me, just given how much um, law schools often rely on government documents for any sort of case study and analysis. So another interesting thing was to drill down further than just the LC classification and look at subject headings. This tells me what types of law are often found at these different law libraries and also where each of the law libraries might be unique. So for, um, for each of them, I looked at and sorted the pivot table to give me what are the top um, different subject headings aside from law, because we all know that's going to show up a lot um, that can be found. So I have a screenshot here with an example of the University of Ottawa, but to give you other overviews at Queens, we see international law come up, constitutional, civil rights, human rights and criminal law. Um, we see um, human rights come up quite a bit. Um, we also see constitutional law in Canada come up in Ottawa. Um, and then we also have Toronto um, where ha we have other things like contracts. What's interesting here is that just using the subject headings, I can kind of figure out what types of subjects are fairly like core subjects when it comes to law. So for example, we see constitutional laws always in that top five subject headings. So it's probably a pretty key topic that we're gonna really need to build on to really have a foundational collection. But it also tells me where each um, university law library kind of is unique. So for example, Queens has quite a bit of international law, which is unique. In Ottawa, which wasn't too surprising to me, there's a lot of stuff on Canada, which makes sense considering it is right by the federal government. Um, in Toronto, um, we see a bit of international law, but we also see civil rights and contract, which was kind of unique. So it helps us to determine what libraries and which law collections we might focus on if there was a specific subject we wanted to delve into further, because we would probably want to go to a library or look at a set of holdings that kind of focus on that uniquely. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do was look at the government documents. So once I realized there was a significant enough proportion of the collection that did have government documents, I wanted to try to figure out what are the nature of those government documents that are kept in law libraries? Why is it that these specific government documents are pulled out of the regular collection and put specifically into a law library? So there are a lot of questions we can ask about when they're published, what kind of content they covered, and that sort of thing. So as an example, one thing I learned is that the government documents kept in the Queens Law Library were for the most part published in the 1980s. Another interesting thing to wonder is how do the government document collections compare between law libraries? So as you can see in these screenshots, we are no longer in Gold Rush. Um, at some point I did have to pull this stuff out of Gold Rush. Um, so you can export reports and you can export um, your search results um, which will then be emailed to you in an Excel file, and then you can clean them up a little bit. So this is a bit of a cleaned up version where I've put things into a table, standardized the way that the titles are formatted and that sort of thing. So I can start to do other types of comparisons that kind of drill even further down. So this project is still a bit ongoing, So, but there are quite a few questions I've been able to kind of think about and ponder as I've done this first part of the law library analysis. So one of the first things I thought about was the print collection. I wonder, again, like as I keep searching and analyzing, what are the kinds of government documents that are housed at each library? How do they compare to each other? What might we learn from that? Another interesting thing to think about is 
What are the types of journals that are housed at each library? How do those compare to each other? And then also, what does the overlap in those monographs look like? What are the key titles to look for? What's gonna help us build that core collection? And then for electronic, how do we take what we learn from the print materials and start applying that to an electronic source analysis? What are key electronic sources and that sort of thing? And then because there was a bit of an indexing issue with Western, I still have quite a few questions about Western that need to be answered. So reflecting on these two examples and reflecting on Gold Rush as a whole, um, I wanted to kind of end now by thinking about benefits and drawbacks and that sort of thing. So one of the big benefits of Gold Rush is how time efficient it is. Like those analyses where I'm able to get those numbers in a graph really quickly, that, that's very time efficient. Um, most of those, especially the Gold Rush analyses for Keep It Down's view, didn't take very long to do. I could get the answers even in less than a day. And so being able to do that without having to manually go through and match titles or do anything in Excel to really like start matching things up, it takes a lot less time. Um, the other great thing is that the filters in Gold Rush really help me to drill down into specific collections. I can look at a very specific subset of the collection. I can compare different locations at different universities. So for example, I don't have to compare um, memorials, DocuGuard to all of University of Toronto. I can do something as specific as saying, hey, what exists in um, University of Toronto's Downsview collection? How does that compare to Memorial's DocuGuard collection? I can get that specific. Another really great thing that I found is that you can just analyze a single library's holdings. You don't have to do a comparison. That became especially useful as we've been working on this law library analysis, because if I want to understand each of the law libraries on their own, I need to look at the character of those collections, and I need to be able to just look at them on their own before I do any sort of comparison. Um, another thing that's become very evident is that as we compare Memorial's holdings to these different libraries and different library branches, we've been able to open a lot of really interesting questions to consider in the future. So I think one of the key ones that I thought like that we I had mentioned earlier was the fact that we're starting to wonder with the Keep It Downs View initiative, what is the significance of the fact that our library collection kind of has this very unique and changing overlap when we compare it to just a single university library versus all of the libraries in the Keep It Downs View initiative. You know, when we see the overlap drastically decrease as we add more libraries in, it makes us wonder how we might start coordinating any sort of um, contribution to Downsview among the university library partners. And actually, as a result of this, we're going to be delving into that question even further in the coming weeks. And we will be using Gold Rush to figure that out. We want to be able to kind of take different collections and see what happens beyond just, oh, there's only a 30% amount of unique content to Memorial compared to the other libraries. We want to think about, well, where are things particularly unique? Which subsets of our collection are more unique or less unique than others? Are there subsets of the collection where perhaps there are not just two university libraries that own the item, but maybe three or four or five? When you're trying to coordinate more than just two different libraries within the partnership, how do you work on that? How do you consider how to coordinate those items and how do you work together to make sure that multiple people aren't contributing the same item? These are the kind of questions we're hoping to answer. And it came from just a very simple overlap analysis in Gold Rush, and it's leading to even more kind of complicated analyses that we'll be doing in the future. Um, there are definitely some drawbacks and errors. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's flawless. So one of the interesting things is that entering search strings sometimes can be a little bit challenging just because the order of the filters and the comparisons you make matter. So I believe I mentioned this earlier, um, but what I tend to do, and this is in a guide that maybe I can share with everyone, um, is that I filter down to a very specific collection first before I even start to compare. So instead of saying, I'm going to compare a memorial to University of Toronto libraries and then go, oh, I want just books. I don't want government documents. What I do first is say, I want to look at Memorial University. I want to look at just the print books at Memorial University. I don't want the government documents and I want them from this location. And then I hit compare to University of Toronto Libraries. So you really need to be watching your search string and always checking at the top just to make sure that the filters are in the order you want them in and that none of the filters get dropped as you can continue to like 
make the search a bit more complex. Um, another thing is that sometimes there are errors in indexing. So it's really important that you have a bit of a sense to some degree of how large a particular collection should be. So as I mentioned, that Western one um, numbers were starred in a few of the slides. And it's because the first time we ran those searches, um, the overlap was incredibly low, absolutely unusually low. And then when I did some investigating and looked at what was indexed in the Western Library collection, um, allegedly there was only 228,000 print books that existed at Western, which we all know is very inaccurate and not true. There are many more print books. So there was an indexing error and we did have to wait for that to be solved before I could continue on. But it's easy enough to solve these kind of issues. Um, and then the final thing is that comparing a location at one library to a branch at a library is a bit more complex. So in this top screenshot here, if you look, this is comparing Memorial to Downsview specifically. Um, at the bottom here in that first set of numbers in set one that I've highlighted, um, we have the total, which is the number of items in DocuGuard of 185,929. But then we have 111,000 being unique, 74,000 being common. That is not actually the comparison between Memorial and University of uh, Toronto Library's Downsview campus specifically. That is between Memorial and University of Toronto Libraries as a whole. But if you look at the top here at our search results where it says 34,012 items found, that is the true overlap number between Memorial University Library and um, Downsview specifically. So you just have to be a little careful and really watch where you're getting your numbers from and making sure that you know where to read things from. Um, but I found that after a couple searches, it's pretty easy to figure this out and to work with it. And the speed at which you can get items, I think is personally worth it. And that's everything I have for you today. So perfect, we have about 15, 20 minutes for questions. I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, we have had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, awesome. So I'm not sure if you want me to read them out to you or whether you want to just look at them. OK, I believe I can see them. Um, so here, I'll turn back on my video so everyone can see me again. <laughs> OK, so. Um, so very good question. I'll just start reading them in order that I've got them here. So the first one comes from Jacqueline and it's about uh, logistics with retention. Um, so the couple and the paper um, or any other print archives have not been consulted yet, primarily because the Keep It Down to partnership is about just comparing among the partners, but also because with Gold Rush, I could only compare to um, libraries and archives that have put their holdings and indexed their holdings in Gold Rush. So unless that index exists, um, I can't access it for comparison. So the power of Gold Rush comes from everyone being able to do that sort of like do that sort of indexing so that we can all access it. Um, okay. So yes, um, to answer your question, Cynthia, that I see here, um, I, you have to have the library upload their catalog records to Gold Rush in order to do this comparison in Gold Rush. Um, otherwise, um, it will it won't work. It only works for anything that's been indexed. So does that imply that they need to be uh, they need to be subscribed to Gold Rush in order for us to have their records? I believe so. Yes. Um, so once that happens, you are able to send um, your indexed files to Gold Rush, um, and then the staff there will take it and then upload it into the server, and then from there you can start doing analyses. Um, you can also kind of you don't have to send everything at once. Um, so. Indexing has been an ongoing process. Gold Rush updates its indexes about once a month, usually around the first of every month. So say you wanted to start with just sending your print collection or just a subset of your journals, you can start with that one month and then maybe another month you send another chunk of your index and they'll add that. So it is always growing um, depending on when and how you choose to upload things. So I know for a while um, it was mostly just the print um, items that were uploaded to Gold Rush for the Keep It Down's View partners. And then over the last couple of months, electronic files have slowly been up uploaded so that we can see the electronic collections as well. Thanks. Um, so when you're uh, answering the questions, if possible, can you just, because uh, there may be some people who can't see the chat. Um, I'll read them. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. 
So now we have another one from Nicole. So what level of granularity is possible in Gold Rush? For example, is it possible to compare title lists and databases, or are you comparing only the databases as a whole? Um, sorry, I need another drink. I've been talking for a while. Um, so I haven't worked too much with the journal comparison um, feature in Gold Rush, so I don't know if maybe perhaps you can compare um, title lists and databases that way. Um, but with the decision to support and the catalog tool that I've been working with specifically and I've spoken to today, um, you won't be able to see items and whether there is like whether the item is associated with a particular database. So let's just say, for example, you're subscribed to the Journal of Academic Librarianship and it's on a specific database. I won't like when I'm doing these comparisons, I don't know that that's where it's housed. I'm just looking at things at the title level rather than at the database level. Um, you might be able to do some of that with the um, comparing journal titles list. I haven't worked enough with that to speak to that, um, but I believe you can get lists that way. From Anne, am I able to compare my library's print holdings to a commercial database or package? Um, again, when you're looking at the comparing library catalogs um, section of Gold Rush, you are very much just comparing catalog to catalog. So I am looking at other university libraries that have uploaded their holdings to Gold Rush. Um, again, there might be some sort of, oh, Allison might have an answer to us. Yes, so as Allison has pointed out, um, Allison Amby, who I work with over at MUN, the comparing journals titles tool on Gold Rush does allow for that comparison of the large commercial databases. So for um, kind of what you are asking here, Nicole, and a bit kind of to what you're asking, Anne, that's the area of Gold Rush you'd be wanting to go to and explore for that kind of database level analysis, not the very specific holding level analysis. Okay. Um, can you speak to the onboarding process? This comes from Julie, sorry. Um, what was involved with getting your holdings into the database? Um, that I think you'd have to more speak to Allison and Louise. Um, because at some, um, because this actually the um, uploading of the items happened right before I actually started at MUN. So um, I've worked more with the searching and the overlap analysis rather than the actual indexing process. Um, from what I know of when the Western issue happened, there is um, a bit of like a time consuming process that can, can come from the type of cataloging that happens. Um, the other thing I know is that Gold Rush does try to standardize and like come up with a standardized version of different cataloging um, like records, but they will also retain a copy of your unique record. So if you kind of have your item indexed in a particular way, it keeps that as well as um, some version of it that can be used to compare the same item that's been indexed differently from different universities. Um, I, I just put it in the chat, but I was going to, I might as well say it out loud. Allison, are you able to unmute and just quickly do a little uh, speak to that question about the onboarding or is that something? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So um, uh, mo mostly the onboarding was taken care of by our cataloging department. So it involved um, uh, providing records in a specified format uh, to the folks at, at, um, at Gold Rush. And um, I I don't know exactly what their back end processes were, um, but just to speak to some of the other questions about the um, the journal analysis tool, um, uh, the, the 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 other kind of module in Gold Rush is the comparison tool for large packages, and um, that as far as I know, the last time I played with it, it didn't necessarily compare. Uh, the package to your own your own library's holdings, but if you, for example, wanted to, to take a look at whether or not to subscribe to a particular EBSCO package, you would be able to compare the title list with the ProQuest package that you already perhaps subscribe to, something along those lines. Um, and uh, like I said in the chat, I'm uh, email me and <laughs> I'm happy to set up a, a screen sharing time. Uh, uh, for a few folks, if you want to just take a get a sneak peek of what that side of Gold Rush looks like. Mm -hmm. 
Um, another interesting thing is that you can export some of the reports. So I'm sure that you can export some of these if you wanted to compare to your catalog. I just don't think you can do it within Gold Rush itself. So I'm, I'm just looking at the questions here. Um, so there was a couple. Um, basically, there was one about uh, a potential for a follow up uh, webinar related to onboarding and what the cataloging uh, department did and, and would have to do in order to onboard a gold rush. Um, so I'll, I've noted that uh, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, and I know uh, Allison did <laughs> if you're not able to read the chat, I will read it out to you that Allison has graciously said that she is happy to provide an online demo at any time for anyone who would like to take a sneak peek. Um, so uh, just email her and I did post her uh, email address in the chat, amb at mun.ca. Um, so there uh, is potential for uh, other sessions uh, related to Gold Rush in the future. So if you have any um, topics you would like us to explore further, please let me know and uh, I can I can arrange to get those uh, sessions created. So are there any other questions in uh, either in the chat or you can unmute as well? Uh, please feel free to unmute and ask your questions verbally. I have a question for the Copal folks on the call. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what what uh, tools do you currently use to manage span uh, and and try to figure out the the overlap between the institutions that are engaged in that uh, project? So is there anybody from Copal who would like to take on that question? Oh, green glass. Green glass. OK, thanks. Um, so for those on the call who may not be familiar, Green Glass is a, another similar collections analysis tool um, but from, I, I forget, Sustainable Collection Services or whatever their name is now, they sold out. Um, so I'm not quite sure. But uh, so Green Glass is a comparable product to Gold Rush. Um, oh, thank you. OCLC does own them now. Yes. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> it's always hard <laughs> to follow who owns whom these days. Um, yes. <laughs> so. Um, and I know, at least in Nova Scotia, they actually uh, a couple of years ago did a project where they did comparison of all their collections across the whole province using Green Glass. So they're, um, I think actually we do have a session posted on our webinars page, uh, a recording of, of the discussion about that Green Glass uh, process. Any other questions for Alexandra or in general or for others in the chat or in the call, excuse me. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much, Alexandra, for sharing the uh, fruits of your labor. Um, it's nice to see the process it, it, and not just the working of Gold Rush, but also the 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 process that it grow, goes into all of the work beforehand before you even get to the databases of formulating those questions uh, yeah gosh thank you everyone yeah um yeah. yeah i think that's probably one of the most interesting things about this was learning how to translate some sort of question or task that you have into actual actual items to be done in gold rush so that's why i really wanted to focus on that today so um thanks everyone for listening in um should I perhaps leave my email in case anyone has any follow-up questions later? Sure, just if you want to post it there, and I'll also when I send out the uh, webinar, uh, the excuse me, when I send out the message to tell everybody uh, that the webinar posting uh, has been posted, uh, excuse me, recording has been posted, I'll also include that information. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. So thank you, everybody, and have a great day.